Here is the second part of this lecture. In this lecture, we shall discuss about silicon-based solar cells. This includes silicon wafer and amorphous silicon thin film based solar cells. Here we shall include following topics in our discussion namely monocrystalline silicon, polycrystalline silicon or multicrystalline silicon, ribbon silicon and monolike multicrystalline silicon. To begin with, let's first discuss the basic difference between the different types of silicon. In monocrystalline silicon, the atoms are arranged in an uniform pattern or array and edges are sharp. Monocrystalline silicon is the most widely used cell material worldwide and it's possible to obtain a conversion efficiency of 14 to 25%. Another is polycrystalline silicon. It has multiple number of single crystalline zones scattered throughout the material. The material quality of multicrystalline material is lower than the single crystalline material. This is largely because of the grain boundaries. The grain boundaries are the localized regions of extra defect energy levels into the band gap which imparts a serious consequence in reducing the performance of the material by blocking the carrier flows and providing shunting paths for the current flow across the PN junction. The third type of silicon is amorphous where all the atoms are scattered in random disorder. The pictures in the right hand side shows the texture of the material. Silicon is obtained from sand, which is chemically silica or SiO2. The sand is processed to obtain silicon and further purified into highly purified single crystalline ingot form. This is then further taken for various applications, namely in wafer solar cells, modules, photovoltaic systems for electricity production. Metallurgical grade silicon is produced by carbothermic reduction of quartz, which is a mineral found in abundance in the continental crust in the form of sand. Quartz is composed of reticular silicon dioxide. Here in the picture shown the carbothermic reduction of silicon dioxide by heating it with carbon or graphite at a very high temperature of 1780 degrees Celsius. The oxygen in the silicon dioxide reacts with carbon to form carbon monoxide and escape away from the furnace. Other gaseous products are silicon oxide and steam which are also made to escape away. The molten metal that is silicon is discharged from the bottom of the crucible and taken for refining. Post refining, the silicon is solidified and crushed to desired size. This metallurgical grade silicon is 98 to 99% silicon with approximately 1 to 2% of impurities, which are mainly iron, aluminium, phosphorus, calcium, titanium, carbon, and boron. Silicon is also obtained from diatomaceous earth, also called as diatomites. It is a naturally occurring soft siliceous sedimentary rock which easily crumbles to fine white powder. It is 80 to 90 percent silica with 2 to 4 percent alumina and 0.5 to 2.0 percent iron oxide. The diatomaceous earth is created from the fossilized remains of diatoms, which are a kind of microalgae found in the oceans, waterways and soils of the world. They generate 20 to 50% of the oxygen produced on the earth 
out of photosynthesis and taken 6.7 billion metric tons of silicon annually from the waters. The pictures in the right hand side shows the live marine diatom organism and the picture below shows the fossilized remains of diatoms. Refining of silicon is carried out by Jokralski or CJ method. It involves melting of crushed silica of metallurgical grade in a fused silica crucible fitted with a furnace, a graphite susceptor and a rotation mechanism to facilitate uniform melting and homogenization of the temperature in the melt. Here in the layout diagrams depicting all the steps in the process of obtaining pure silicon from the melt. We shall see the steps one by one. The steps include melting of polysilicon and or doped silicon, temperature stabilization of the melt, introduction of a seed crystal to the melt and pulling the neck upward with a rotatory movement. Gradually, a shoulder develops and eventually growth of the body resulting into an elongated cylindrical ingot is obtained. Here in this video, we can see each and every step in animation. In the first step, the polysilicon or the metallurgical grade silicon is introduced into the crucible furnace along with graphite for melting. The temperature of the melt is stabilized by rotating movement. In the next step, introduction of a seed crystal is done to the melt surface and pulling the neck upward with a rotating movement. The introduction of a seed crystal is an important step. The seed crystal is a highly purified single crystal. Gradually, a shoulder develops and eventually growth of the body results. After the ingot is obtained from the melt, it is further processed. The surface of the ingot is ground and removed so as to remove the impurities at the top surface. The ingot is sliced using a diamond saw or rotating wires coated with diamond particles which are strong enough to cut the silicon ingot into the size 200 to 400 micrometers of thickness. The saw cut silicon wafers contain many microscopic and nanoscopic scratches or cracks and the surface looks very uneven. So these wafers are etched and properly treated so that the micro scratches are removed.
This process shows dipping of the ingot into the solution of the agent, either KOH or HNO3, to remove the damaged vapor surface. Finally, polishing and cleaning is done. In this process, the silicon wafer is polished onto the surface of fine slurry. The slurry consists alumina or ultra fine diamond particles. The rotating movements along with the cushioning pads provided in the process helps in removing the very fine scratches onto the surface. In the next video, the etching process of the silicon wafer production in a laboratory is shown. The entire manufacturing process is slow and intensive and the raw material cost becomes as high as 20 to 25 dollars per pound of solar cell. For very specific purposes such as making of electronic items or chips, a further purification of the silicon and other semiconductor materials is required. This method is called zone refining. Besides silicon, tellurium, gallium and germanium are required in high purified form for their applications. This technique works on the principle that the impurities have higher solubility in the molten form of the metal as compared to that in the solid form of the metal. The difference in the solubility of impurities in the two different states of the metal makes it possible to segregate the impurities in the metal ingot to be refined. In this process, the ingot or the cylindrical metal rod is placed in a tubular zone refiner and inside this an inert gas environment is maintained. Around the cylindrical metal rod a circular heater is fitted. As the case may be more than one heaters can also be installed. This heater 
can be moved along the rod from one end to the other. Under operative conditions, the heater melts the particular zone of the metal rod at a time along with its impurities. As the heater moves along the length of the rod, the zone previously in the molten stage solidifies. And during the solidification process, the impurities move to the new molten zone in contact with the heater. As the heater further shifts along the length of the metal rod, the impurities keep on shifting to the next zone and eventually to the other end of the rod and gets concentrated there. The concentrated zone is then cut off and removed. This process is repeated for two to three times or more number of times to obtain an ultra high purified metal at the end. The purified silicon is of 99.99 up to the nine places of decimal also called as 99 or the magic nine can be obtained by this method which is desired for making electronic chips. Here, both forms of silicon have been shown. The highly purified monocrystalline ingot form of silicon and polycrystalline silicon slab in the second picture. After cut into wafer form and etching of the same, a single highly purified and polished wafer has been shown here. The picture below shows the fabricated chips onto the wafer and ready to be cut out. Here in the pictures the summarized representation of silicon wafer production and its utilization in the solar cell and solar module manufacturing. Monocrystalline photovoltaic cells are expensive and made of soft cut from single cylindrical crystal of silicon with an average efficiency ranging between 11 to 18 percent. Under a standard set of fabrication and operation, it has been demonstrated to show an efficiency of 25 percent at Sandia National Laboratories. These are usually installed on spacecrafts and space stations and offer warranties up to 25 years. On the other hand, the multicrystalline silicon or polycrystalline solar cell are relatively less expensive and emerged in the market during 1980s. These are obtained from ingot of melted and recrystallized silicon and efficiency is less compared to the monocrystalline silicon by 5%. Under standard set of conditions of fabrication and operation, it has been demonstrated to show an efficiency of 20% at NREL. Polycrystalline solar cells account for 90% of the crystalline wafer silicon solar cell market. Polycrystalline cells do not undergo the cutting process as for single crystalline cells. In a state, the single crystalline or the melted polycrystalline waste silicon is melted and poured into a square mold and this is how the square shape of the polycrystalline silicon wafer is obtained. Additionally, this provides a much more affordable and less or negligible waste generating during the manufacturing of the polycrystalline silicon. Another advantage is 
less tolerance to heat compared to its monocrystalline counterpart. This means that its functioning is compromised in high temperatures. An important component in the solar cells is the contact grids made from bus bars or fingers. Bus bars are the largest stripes and fingers are small stripes made of copper, brass or aluminum which conducts electricity. These metal stripes, if buried in laser formed grooves inside the silicon solar cell, it will allow a larger metal height to width aspect ratios and enhance the performance by 25% compared to the commercial screen printed solar cells. The screen printed solar cells on the other hand appear to show less efficiency because of shading and the losses related to it. And this loss is as high as 10 to 15 percent, whereas the buried contact structure reduces this shading losses down to 2 to 3 percent only. The schematic of a buried contact solar cell is shown here in the picture. The another advantage is that the cost involved in the manufacture of both kinds of cells is the same and efficiency can be greatly increased in the buried contact solar cell. The steps involved in the manufacture of a buried contact solar cell is shown and explained here. First, the process starts with wafer which is uneven due to the saw damage and is coated in cutting fluid. For high efficiency buried contact cell, CJ method is employed. In the second step, a strong alkaline edge cleans up the wafer and removes the damaged outer layer of the silica. Then texturing is employed to the surface. A flat silicon wafer has a high reflectivity, but this can be reduced by texturing the wafer. A second chemical bath is employed which etches preferentially along the crystal planes. Excellent texturing is easily produced on single crystal wafers, but texturing of a multi-crystalline material is a very difficult process. In the next step, Junction formation by doping is done. In this process, the wafer is heated in a furnace at a temperature of 800 to 1000 degrees Celsius with a phosphorus atmosphere which causes small amounts of phosphorus to be incorporated in the other layers of the silicon. This is followed by growth of masking oxide. The wafer is heated to a very high temperature in the presence of water vapor which forms oxide on the outer layers and turns into silicon dioxide which is also called quartz. This is then followed by cutting groups. A series of trenches are then cut in the top surface of the wafer with either a laser or a mechanical saw to about 30 micrometers wide and 80 micrometers deep. The grooves are either cut together as shown here or one at a time. Then group diffusion is carried out by a second heavier phosphorus confined to the grooves by masking oxide. Then application of aluminum back surface field is employed. A layer of aluminum is applied to the rear of the cell by either evaporation of or the screen printing. In the next step, shintering is done. The wafer is held at a high temperature for a long period to melt the aluminum into the silicon and to further diffuse the phosphorus into the silicon. This is followed by copper plating in which a thin barrier layer of nickel 
and then copper is plated to exposed area of the silicon by immersion in a bath with metal salts. Finally, edge isolation is done. The sides are cut from the cell to isolate the front junction from the rear contact. The completed cell is ready for interconnection and encapsulation into a photovoltaic module. Amorphous silicon is not structured or crystallized. Amorphous silicon based solar cells have relatively very low efficiency of about 8 to 13 percent and were mostly used in small scale applications such as pocket calculators as such applications could run on low power output. To obtain a considerable power generation, several amorphous solar cells are placed on the top of one another and make a stacked photovoltaic module. This technology is gaining popularity nowadays for making cheaper alternatives as the material costs are reduced down to 1% of the cost which is involved in producing a crystalline silicon based solar cell. Furthermore, it enables to achieve a more flexible and lightweight solar panels easier to transport and install and less prone to wear and tear or damages of cracking. These are more convenient to cover the curved surfaces. The metal grids required in the crystalline wafer solar cells are replaced by transparent oxides that can make the such solar photomodules even more cheaper. Amorphous silicon has a very high defect density leading to poor photoconductivity and undesirable semiconductor properties. Further, this prevents doping in order to engineer semiconductor properties. However, inducing hydrogen during the fabrication of amorphous silicon, its photoconductivity can be significantly enhanced and doping can be made possible to further enhance its properties. In a very first attempt in 1969, hydrogenated amorphous silicon was fabricated by deposition of silane gas, SiH4, precursor. The deposited thin film showed a lower defect density and increased conductivity due to the presence of impurities. In the year 1975, Doping of SiH using phosphine, which is N-type, or diborane, which is P-type dopants, was explored. The different techniques for deposition employed for amorphous silicon are chemical vapor deposition, plasma-enhanced chemical vapor deposition, catalytic chemical vapor deposition, and sputtering. Sputtering allows direct deposition of amorphous silicon onto the substrate without hydrogen, therefore also known as hydrogen-free deposition. Another thin film using silicon material is microcrystalline silicon or the nanocrystalline silicon thin film. This is just a kind of amorphous silicon containing small crystalline silicon particles. The microcrystalline silicon absorbs a broader spectrum of the light and is flexible. In a modified hybrid technology called microamorphous silicon module technology, the two different types of silicons, namely amorphous silicon and microcrystalline silicon, are combined to form a top and a bottom layer of the photovoltaic cell. Some particular solar cells are made for capturing more efficiently the blue light and increasing the efficiency of the photovoltaic cells during the time when there is no direct sunlight falling on them. Also, 
it is often used to optimize the open circuit voltage of amorphous silicon photovoltaics the efficiency of such photovoltaics are is 10.8% In this schematic diagram, the different layer components of microcrystalline photovoltaic solar cell have been shown. Next in the list is black silicon solar cells. Black silicon solar cells are similar to crystalline silicon solar cells. Black silicon can be manufactured simply by adding a dense network of nanoscale needles on the top of a standard piece of silicon. Modifying the material in this way makes it a lot less reflective, allowing solar cells that use it to trap light even when it's coming from a very low angles. Photovoltaic thermal hybrid solar collectors or PVT are a kind of revolutionized systems which convert solar radiation into electrical as well as store thermal energy. The system is a combination of photovoltaic cell and solar thermal collector which captures the waste heat energy from the photovoltaic module. This makes a good advantage of the heated module as increase in the temperature reduces the efficiency of the module and the solar collector removes this extra heat. This helps in cooling the temperature of the photovoltaic module, hence refreshing its efficiency. In a recent report, it has been demonstrated that amorphous silicon photovoltaic with low temperature Coefficients allow the photovoltaic thermal hybrid solar collectors to be operated at high temperatures. This not only creates a possibility of a symbiotic photovoltaic thermal hybrid system, but also improves the overall performance of the amorphous silicon photovoltaic module to generate electricity by about 10%. This brings us to conclude the second part of this lecture. Now we shall continue to the third part of this lecture.